Hello everyone and welcome to this Tortoise Thinking, a sense maker live trying to answer the question, can the arts survive the virus? Um, a big welcome to all of you, uh, a particular welcome to Victoria Siddle who runs fairs for freeze, uh, to Tristram Hunt who's the director of the Victorian Albert Museum, um, and a huge thank you to Santander who are the bank that is the sponsor of this, our Sense Maker series. Uh, as you know, the aim of Tortoise is not to be in the breaking news business, but trying to understand what drives the news. And every day we put together a daily email called Sense Maker that tries to identify what matters and where it's leading. And in the last few months, we've thought, let's try and take that and use it to really focus in on a specific subject. So we've looked at startups and the small business community we've looked at a different set of things like vaccines and therapies as we did the last week and today we're trying to look at arts and culture and the way in which a thinking works is that it is the engine of our journalism it's intended to be like an open news meeting we really want to hear what you think your experience your point of view and the reason, in fact, we're here is that we held a think in a couple of weeks ago, Hannah Rothschild, the former uh, chair of the National Gallery, was just talking about the scale of the challenge facing arts organisations, particularly regional ones, particularly orchestras and theatres. And it prompted us to think in all of this, the coverage of the health crisis, the coverage of the economic crisis that's unfolding, are we really understanding what's at stake in the arts? And so we wanted to bring people together, A, to understand it, and B, if we could, think a little constructively about what could happen next. Um, if you've not been to a thinking before, and if for some reason you haven't had the terrible misfortune of doing a Zoom call with members of your own family, just to let you know how Zoom works is, you can weigh in in two ways, either in the chat, my um, uh, colleague, the, the great editor Liz Mosley, is here trying to corral all the people who are making points, thoughts uh, in the chat. As you do that, I'll probably pick on you and say, oh, hello, um, I see this point, do you want to weigh in in the conversation or feed it into the discussion we're having? And separately, you'll see there's a participants tab at the bottom of the screen. If you click on the participants tab, there's a little grey box that says raise hand. And if you if you can raise your hand, that's a way also of kind of um, uh, grabbing my attention. And it means that uh, I can come to you uh, and uh, and hear what you think. And that's really the key element of it. I can't stress strongly enough. We really want to hear you hear what you think. Um, before uh, I sort of make everyone terribly gloomy and talk about the scale of the challenge to the arts, uh, Victoria, we catch you today um, uh, at Freeze actually getting on and doing something new. Do you want to just tell us uh, what you're trying to do uh, today? Sure. Um, thank you for having me today and welcome everyone. Um, Today would have been the preview day of Freeze New York, which is one of the fairs that we at Freeze stage every year. Uh, it takes place on Randall's Island in Manhattan. It's obviously not taking place physically this week. Um, so we'd been developing an online uh, viewing room platform, luckily for a few months now. Um, and so when we were forced to cancel the fair in New York, we kind of pivoted that and ramped up the development and essentially have created an online viewing room. Um, and we've taken the entire what would have been physical art fair and done our best to place it on this online platform. Um, and it launches this afternoon, which is when Freeze New York would have opened uh, to collectors, curators and the art community. And then it will be up um, until the 15th of May for anyone to visit. It has the, sort of the same, has 200 gallery platforms there, each showing at least 30 works. Um, it has the curated content um, that you find at all of our fairs. And there are even ways um, through the kind of content on our website to order food from the restaurants in New York who would have been present at the fair. So we've tried to give it this sort of real feeling of an event. Um, and I mean, why this is important at the moment is mainly because the works that are sold by this website will mean money going to galleries and to artists at this time. Um, so we're really hoping for a successful week. And of course, everybody here, please join. Um, yeah. It's a launch and a trial and we need feedback. <laughs> okay, well, that's, well, well, let, well, let's talk a little bit more about that digital transformation in the course of the hour. Um, uh, and I'm going to come actually, um, one of the people who's helped 
bring so many people together today is Simon Walker from Marquee TV. And Marquee TV is another sort of platform, really interesting platform, uh, Simon, platform for what's happening in terms of digital transmission of the arts and, and reach of the arts. Um, but in the real world, Tristram, you were just saying before we uh, got going that you'd actually managed to get into the VNA yesterday. What was it like? Yes, no, it was a great treat um, being able to go into the museum and have some conversations with our security team and see everything on the ground. But one of the interesting elements was, um, and one of the challenges for, for reopening was the dust, the South Kensington dust. Um, and the interesting thing about having three and a half million people come through the museum uh, a year is that keeps everything moving in terms of the environment. And without them, actually, we're gonna face a real problem about getting the museum ready, cleaning it, getting it all spick and span when we're ready to reopen. Um, so it was, it was wonderful to see, but we'll, we'll need to give it some, some TLC before we reopen. So see, a proper, a proper dusting down. Exactly. Well, I, well, exactly, I, said, exactly. I, I said I would try and sort of- Proper dusty museum now. Uh, lift, exactly, lift, lift, the lift the spirits to start with. And I suppose hearing that Freeze is, you know, launching digitally today, that actually you're in and seeing what's happening at the VNA is encouraging to some. But, but I have to say my starting point is, is close in spirit to the point that Alison makes in the chat already. She says, I, actually, I'd love to bring her in if she's happy to talk about it. I live in Newcastle where the lively creative arts community is under huge threat. How can we make sure the voices coming from the roots and shoots of the arts are heard and answered? I want to just ask everyone on the call, if they can, just to press that participants button and go and answer this question. How many people think that in the course of the next two years, one quarter of the arts organizations in this country will go under. If you think yes, as many as one quarter of the arts organizations will go under, put your, put your hand up. I just want to see what the scale is of the concern. So we're about, so there are about 350 people joining us at the moment. As things stand, it's about 200 and sort of about 130. So a third of people are worried about that scale. But Tristram, can I come back to you? I know that there's a, there's a, there's a very different world, you know, not just um, in terms of scale, but also in terms of economics, if you're running something like the VNA. But can you give us sort of granular sense of what you think you're looking at in the next six to 12 months in terms of visitors, finances, and how you're thinking about it? I mean, I don't think we should be in any doubt that this is a major, major challenge for arts organisations, big and small. So for an organisation like the VNA, um, we have um, around three and a half million visitors to the South Kensington uh, site, four million um, in a good year. 50% of them come from abroad. Um, and there's absolutely no sign that we're going to see uh, tourist visitors coming back to London for for a year. So already you're taking out 50%. Uh, um, then we have, um, you know, Londoners coming, those from South East and, and uh, those from right across the country. And at the moment we're modelling a kind of 80, 85% fall in visitor numbers. So when we do reopen um, either late summer, or early autumn, we'll begin with kind of 10 to 15% of our normal visitor flow. And that might build up uh, towards 30, 40% by this time next year. So that is going to have a massive impact uh, on our finances and our ability to run the organisation. But to, to all the points that have been raised, that trickles down to all sorts of organisations. We have a Friday late programme, last Friday of the month, where we bring in you know, young arts organisations, new designers, creatives, and they use the VNA as this canvas to explore yeah. some of their ideas. We can't manage that in an era of social distancing. We can't manage that if we're, if we're seeing a real hit to some of our funding. So those kind of elements which support the broader creative ecology 
of art um, and culture in the country. That's also one of the challenges when big institutions are hit by big falls in, in their number. There's a, there's a trickle down effect that we also need to be alert to because we need to support that creativity. We've got a responsibility to support those artists and designers and creatives into the future. And so how we manage our own priorities will be, you know, we need to be alert to that. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull in uh, if you've not been to a thinking in our newsroom before it's like a news meeting everyone sort of weighs in along the way so I'm going to pull in if I may Alison who 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 made a point right at the start uh, Alison can you tell us a little about what you're seeing in in Newcastle and what you're specifically what the kind of organizations you think are that are in are, are in are in danger yes certainly uh, the one that's closest to my heart is um, an extraordinary small venue called Alphabeti Theatre, um, which puts on, it, it actually produces its own productions, but it also gives space for all sorts of wacky and wonderful uh, new young artists, artists from around the country who come. It's a space they painted themselves, you know, one of those places from which great artists spring. And uh, we've got a similar kind of thing up here in, in terms of visual arts as well. And um, it's so difficult. It's so difficult for them ever to get a national um, ear anyway. Um, Northern, I'd say there is some, there is some support okay from the, the regional arts organizations. But I, I, I could do, I think we could really do with the people at the VNA level, and I love the VNA, I would never say we, we really must support it, to keep remembering. And Kristen, you're talking about um, supporting uh, people at your, your, your events. But of course, um, does that reach the Northeast? My, my, my daughter's in the theatre and I can tell you it hardly ever does, and that applies. How on earth do we get, is this a good time to actually really shout loudly about the importance of regional arts? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm going to, to, to just, Tristan, can you just tell us a little bit, just to, just to follow up on Alison's point, what is happening behind the scenes about, if you like, the sort of big beasts in terms of cultural institutions trying to help in that ecology and specifically how are if you're alphabeti theatre in newcastle what what hopes have you got of getting funding who, who do you think you're getting it from well i think i think in terms of the big national museums um all of us have a real sense of our national responsibilities and whether it's you know the vna our kind of design education programs whether it's our work with the wedge museum in stoke whether it's vna dundee up at uh, Tayside, whether it's support for the, for the Bose Museum um, up in um, up in the northeast, we we're really clear that the collection that we hold in South Kensington has to be shared as widely as possible through partnerships and loans uh, and support for regional cultural um, institutions, and that's absolutely uh, vital if we're going to continue to ask government for money as as um, as a national museum. And all of us, I think, have that that sensibility, but we can always be pushed. Um, to do more. I think in terms of smaller cultural organisations that uh, institutions like the VNA cannot sort of support in terms of, of, of funding. The conversations I've had, be it with the Art Fund, the Heritage Lottery Fund, the Arts Council, some of the big private philanthropists, the Western families, the Sainsbury's, they're really alert to the crisis that is taking place at the grassroots cultural organizations and they're thinking how do we sort of move some of our money away from capital funding you know new galleries new projects in, in, in the next year to support revenue funding but I, I think their challenge is to work out you know which organization is going to last through this the next year um, two three years and get behind them which will get them over this kind of immediate challenge of covid so I think there's there's a strong sense amongst those with funds that they have to support through revenue funding exactly the small theatre group that your daughter is working in um, in in the northeast and the challenge will be to get in front of them and to get the support. So I'm I'm going to come back to that with with a number of people and Victoria I'd like to come to you to talk in a moment about galleries but there's been a sort of slew of 
comments about, particularly around theatres around those those places where people are going to be in close proximity and particularly those places where their audiences tend to be an older demographic um i, I kathy baker is the i know is the development director at the hampstead theater and you said kathy in the chat i noticed that possibly it'd be more than a quarter of arts organizations that might uh, might go under and i see that someone has cited a, uh, a note from from, uh, from one London borough pointing to the possibility of as many as 80% worrying about their futures. Mm -hmm. Cathy, what's your, what's your read on specifically theatres and how they, how they operate? And I declare an interest, I'm a board member of the Hampton Theatre. Hello James, hi, hi everyone. Um, so yes, I'm development director, so I look after the philanthropic income which so far is bearing up, but obviously we're only two months into the situation. Um, I think what's extraordinary for all of us across all businesses actually is things are changing day by day and when we had our farewell meeting when we left the theatre um, we said oh we'll see you in June we'll be back in June uh, and then a week later we said oh how naive we were we'll be opening in September um, and now we probably won't be opening until at least January and we don't even know if it will be then. Um, what I think is really difficult with the funding regardless of one size is the absence of funds to go around and my understanding from the Arts Council is that the emergency funding they've put in place is limited and they're drawing on their own reserves anyway so once that's been shared out there's nothing more. Um, I don't know what this government will think the role of the DCMS and the Arts Council will be uh, given the huge challenges that are ahead. Um, as I say our own experience of philanthropy is that people have been very uh, thoughtful and very kind but clearly if they're individual patrons giving 600 pounds a year or if they're major donors giving five and six figures their own finances a challenge so james i think i think the issue is um is it just a huge web of difficulty that we're in the that we are part of um yeah. i think I mean, sounds depressing, but no no <laughs> I, and I, but i think we're right to call it out because I, i'm concerned about the fact that if as tristram says you're moving from cat, capital investment to revenue subsidy in effect just the scale of money that's needed is enormous the reality is that people's own finances are going to be hugely challenged as you mm -hmm. say so there is the absence mm -hmm. of funds and we're still talking about giving we're not talking about lending where the government's stepping in it's stepping in with loans with the arts the expectation is still around you know gifts and the question of government-backed lending for the arts seems to me to be a really important one. I'm, I'm gonna, before I come to something else, I just want to go back, Victoria, to you, because obviously the world of, you, you, you live in both worlds, if you like, you're not in the theatre world, but the nature of the Freeze Art Fairs is that they really thrive on that experience of being together. Um, can you give us a sense of what you think is gonna happen in the, in the art world? Um, and, and forgive me, I really don't understand the art world on a good day. So, so in this circumstance, who, who suffers? Artists, gallery owners, art lovers? How, how does it play out? So I've been kind of, as you say, kind of it, 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 between different, looking at many different angles of this, I think, is mm. these are in this sort of unique position of working with so many people across the board. We work with galleries, obviously, with artists, with museums. I also chair the board of a small non-profit art organisation, Studio Voltaire in South London. Um, so I'm seeing it from their perspective as well. Um, I mean, the interesting thing about this time is how much collaboration has come out of this. You know, I've been on calls with 50 London gallery owners. I've been on calls with directors of all of the sort of smaller London institutions, um, non-profits and so on. So kind of hearing all of their different perspectives. And I mean, there's a huge amount of concern um, around jobs and for the, the people running galleries, how they keep people employed and also for artists, um, you know, speaking to non-profits, a lot of them, they're obviously concerned for their own well-being, but, um, and their own futures, but they, they work so closely with artists, they exist to support artists. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, technically everything we do all comes back to the artists. Um, and, and I think there's real concern about supporting them at this time, especially the artists who are not necessarily the big commercial artists who do really well from, you know, selling paintings, but artists who are also art handlers um, or who do part-time jobs in other areas and who are struggling at the moment to sort of find out what subsidies might be available to them. And it's a concern about those sort of people slipping through the cracks. Um, 
Can, can I, I'm, I just want to bring in a few people to respond to that because I think there's some people who, while you were talking, Victoria, were saying exactly that. They were talking about what does and doesn't work. Mm. I was struck that, you know, Mandy Berry is saying that loans are not necessarily going to work and talking about the impact in Cornwall. Are you, are you there, Mandy? Yeah. Can I bring you in? Yeah. So, so, what's, so what are you seeing? Well, Cornwall is really quite devastated. Um, as you would know from the, your own research, it taught us that um, Cornwall is an incredibly poor region in the UK and the economy for the arts and culture in Cornwall is very much linked to tourism as well and obviously with tourism taking a big hit it's like having a double whammy. Arts organisations are small in Cornwall. I'm the chair of a touring theatre company in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. um, we, we like others live on a shoestring. Um, loans won't work because we will it, I can't see in any kind of business model that we could try and do, and I've spent much of my career looking at innovative business models in the creative industries. I can't see how we could get one where we could significantly play back a, a sizable loan of any kind. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to look at different models. We're going to have to look at different ways of working. We're already putting content out digitally at the moment. That's free. Obviously that couldn't go on as being free forever. Mm. Um, but I think in the regions, in places like Cornwall, in the northeast, in Cumbria, there are real problems and they're actually quite different problems in some ways to those in the big cities and metropolitan areas, as is true in normal times, but it's exacerbated mm. in the time right. of coronavirus. I suppose, I mean, to be honest with you, Mandy, to the extent I was trying to work out how would you create a system that the government might borrow and back some of the support for the arts rather than directly lending, but to an extent it's the same question, which is who is going to step in and provide the volume of funding that's, that's going to be needed. Um, I mean, one of the things I should just say, you know, it, it's, it, it may cause a hollow laugh at a time like this, but we set up Tortoise with the idea that you could actually be a constructive newsroom and try and think about ways out of this. And certainly in the last 15, 20 minutes, I'd like us to try and, when we get there, try and think about well, okay, what's, what's needed. I think, From your point of view, Mandy, what would that be? Well, I think there are, instead of looking at, at loans, I think one could look at different ways of investing. And right. instead of grants, you could talk about investments. I mean, there are ways that actually you can create, you know, the arts organisations can learn and be helped to learn to look at the IP that actually they, that, that they are generating and about how to protect and exploit that IP. So there are different sort of funding models that are not, you know, not straightforward loans, not straightforward grants, but where you make investments that can be recouped over time in the arts. We had investment into in Miracle Theatre from um, mining world heritage into a production that we did. And we're actually been able to, through having created a digital version of that, being able to re, you know, to, to actually sort of um, pay some of that investment back. So okay. there, are, there are ways of doing it, but they're, they're, they're different models. So it's not like bank loans. It's got to be a different kind of way of looking at how the money, the money travels and also creating ongoing um, resource in financial terms to, to fund the, to feed the arts. So, so uh, Mandy, thank you for that. I, I'm going to ask, if I might, I'd like to bring in Simon Walker. I said at the beginning, it would be interesting to hear about the experience of Marquee TV, partly because, it, you know, long before this, it was a platform established to try and make the arts much more accessible and accessible digitally. Now, I suppose we're asking a slightly different question of you, Simon, which is, is it also a, a platform to make the arts sustainable economically? Yeah, well, that, I mean, I always feel guilty in these conversations because we're the arts organisation that's doing really well out of lockdown because people, you know, can't get to the theatres. So um, they're watching on our on services like Marquee TV. So we're a streaming service for performing arts at the moment, opera, ballet, theatre, etc. And we're adding visual arts and music. Um, and what's <clears throat> what's really interesting for us is our US experience, actually. So. My co-founders were in London and in New York. And of course, in the US, there is no public subsidy at all for any of this, um, uh, any sector of the arts. And what there was, uh, Donald Trump has canned. There's a different philanthro philanthropic um, series of support. Um, but, you know, what we've done is create a subscription product. So, you know, our, our um, audience has trebled um, since lockdown started. Um, and, you know, it's a new revenue stream for arts organisations 
crucially, who have content. Um, so if you're the Royal Opera, Opera House, the Royal Shakespeare Company, who are our partners, they um, capture that content, which is an expensive thing to do, and we can monetize that for them. And it's a major new revenue stream. It's their only revenue stream at the moment. Um, so they're very, very supportive of growing it. The challenge that you have, um, and I'm on record as being uh, a, a skeptic of how the UK creative industries have gifted our value to YouTube and Facebook and the US tech giants, who've effectively strip mined the US, the UK creative industries for years now. The issue is people are trying to respond by giving this stuff away for free. Um, and Mark, my co-founder in New York, is seeing the following effect in the US, which is a bit ahead of where we are. Kind of five stages of arts grief, if you like. Stage one, we've shut it down. Sorry, we've had to cancel our season. Stage two, hey, don't worry though, we're free. We're, we're streaming it all on YouTube. Feel free to donate. Um, stage three, oh god, this is going to take a lot longer than we thought. Um, and the artists are a bit annoyed that we're streaming their content for free on YouTube. YouTube quite like it though. Stage four okay, we've canceled the autumn season as well. Um, please donate. Um, and by the way, we've had to pay our artists twice because we gave away their nutcracker on YouTube and now we're having to pay them for the one that isn't going to be made. But check out our autumn season streaming um, uh, campaign. Um, and then kind of stage five is, oh dear, everyone had a free to YouTube. So no one watched ours. There were no digital revenues. YouTube turned out not to be our friend. Um, and I'm afraid we're going to have to shut the company down. And I'm sorry that sounds grim, but that is literally what we're seeing right now happening in the US. Um, now, they don't have subsidies, and we have people rushing to us at Marquee TV saying, because we license things properly and we make them money and, you know, artists get paid. Um, the, the issue in the US is um, that because of the way the unions work, it's very rare that these performances are captured. So, you know, the LA Opera, who one of our partners, don't actually have any content. When they do film it, um, the union agreement usually means they have to destroy the footage immediately after a live stream. So it's and, not so, there. <laughs> and Simon, what's the, you know, one of the, Joe, can you explain a little bit in terms of, can Marquee TV provide a sufficient stream of revenue to, to sustain? I mean, I know it's not going to replace the revenue from physical sales, but, but what are we talking about in terms of the kind of percentage that theatre organisations, dance companies, orchestras might hope to get in terms of piecing back together their revenue for the next six to 18 months? Look, we, uh, it's a really good question. Um, and we, we obviously can't substitute for an in-person experience, right? But I think going forward, you're going to have um, a world where people expect there to be a virtual version of any performance or presentation mm. going forward anyway. I mean, we, my team and I were just on a call with our partners at the Royal Opera House this morning. Um, and, you know, their assumption is, because they've got an older audience for Covent Garden in person, you know, their feedback from their members and friends is, until there's a vaccine, I'm not I'm coming, coming. Yeah. right? Um, and in that environment, you know, and by the way, their live to cinema program is stopped as well. That was their other big revenue stream. Their secondary revenue stream was broadcasting to cinemas. That's all off as well. Um, so what they've done is bring forward those rights so that we can stream them to people's homes directly. So it's a significant new revenue stream. Um, look, it's not going to make up for in-person ticket sales until everyone wants to watch at home. But look what happened with Netflix and, um, you know, the, the movie business. I was, I've been working in on-demand media for 25 years and I, I worked with Netflix when they first started. They started licensing back catalog. It wasn't that attractive. Obviously it was a DVD business. Fast forward uh, 20 years, they put $15 billion into the, um, you know, the TV and film production sector mostly goes to drama producers and, you know, talent on that side, screenwriters. Um, in our small way, Marquee TV can do that on the arts side, um, but it needs to be a partnership. I mean, the thing that Netflix, YouTube, the big US guys do, it, they don't care what the content is. They don't care about your production company or your theater or your ballet group. They just want content that can keep people in their big bucket of payments. Um, we genuinely are trying to partner with the sector. So the conversations with arts organizations 
yeah, we can monetize your content. But if you've got an email list, if you've got a friends program or a patrons program, people are paying 50 pounds a year, whatever, to get early bird tickets. What value is that when there's no ticket? Well, yeah, it's valuable to us, right? Because I can, I can now, people are paying that money. Well, you can now have this benefit. You can have a tier of marquee for free. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will, Simon, I will, I'll come back. There, there are two things just to say in the chat while you've been speaking. One is um, Oliver Clark saying a couple of people that he represents are artists who've been on the Marquee TV platform, but weren't aware and haven't got paid. So you may want to respond to him in the chat. <laughs> and someone else says, someone also says, by the way, uh, can you write down the five stages of grief? Yes. So I, as I come to a couple of others. Um, I, I'm going to pick up on a point that that um, I'm going to. I just want to go back to Tristram on something, which is the politics of this. You know, David McLean has picked up on a point that my colleague and fellow editor Matt Dancona has made here, which is the problem that the arts is an afterthought. And you know, to be fair to politicians, at this time you can understand why it's an afterthought. You've got health, you've got the economy. How how do you? How do you organize, how do you mobilize arts organizations, Tristram, so that you do it in a way that doesn't seem out of touch with the scale of the problems that government and politicians are dealing with, but does give a sense of urgency? And, and what are the channels and institutions that can address this problem? I think, um, I think that's a fascinating question. And I think we all understand that in the hierarchy of need, you know, ventilators and PPE for social care homes uh come first and i think we all sort of get that um i think some of us in in, in the kind of arts and culture sector have been um a little bit surprised by the kind of concentration on sports uh rather than the broader cultural and artistic sector um i think a, a, a bit of political kind of a reach on exactly what we've been talking about, energizing communities through art and culture, thinking about the digital offer, thinking about open air performances, you know, a, a, a bit of push there. Because part of the reason they're focusing on sport at the moment is, as they put it, to raise morale and, and to lift the nation. And we know that art and culture does that, but there's also that deeper sense of I mean, in, in kind of crude transactional terms about well-being and public health that we know arts and culture organisations provide. But there's a broader argument about, in, in a sense, the fabric of the nation. Um, mm. There's the creative industries argument about jobs and the £111 billion put into the UK economy. And that is all absolutely vital. But I think one has to make that, that really deep argument about the fracture that comes from COVID, the, the isolation, the, the, the kind of almost the trauma that, that we're going through and we've been through, and then the place of arts and cultural organisations to help manage that. And that's a difficult, I mean, you, you know, James, that's a very difficult argument to make to politicians. Um, and so we'll also be making the very simple argument that the national collections are at risk. Uh, and we've had a recent report from the National Order Office that says many of our museums and institutions after 10 years of austerity without the Heritage Lottery Fund now supporting big cultural organisations, their collections relative to what's happening in France or Germany or America are not in the shape they should be. So there's a well-being argument, there's a kind of soul of the nation argument, and there's a securing the collections argument. And I think we'll be beginning to make those, you know, once... The, the, the peak has passed and the crisis has passed and we begin to think about you know rebuilding some of the ties right well i i think i think it's really it's really helpful i'd love to hear other people's views on that and there are a number of people who've had their digital hands up and i'm going to come to them uh in a sort of in, in a run I, just to let you know i'm going to almost definitely pronounce everyone's names wrong um that's better than I did last night when I merrily called someone by their wife's name for the whole conversation. So uh, please bear with me. But um, it, Tony Fazaeli, is that you, Tony? Have I got your name yeah, right? Hi. Hello. Um, you, you had your hand up. I was just interested to know what you wanted to say. Um, I was concerned about the pipeline for creative people in the future. So schools, colleges, universities, very challenging to offer practical arts subjects remotely, distance learning, and mm. also as and when the return happens, um, socially distanced. So try doing hot glass at home or ceramics if you don't have a kiln. Yeah. And whether there'll be a, a knock-on consequence longer term. So that also, as Tristan said, to protect the education 
um, side of the arts for the future as well as now. And I love Miracle Theatre. I have to say that. Please support that theatre. It's fantastic. Well, it, it's lovely to say that. I mean, I'm really struck by how many people, you know, in the chat, Tony, are talking about what who is streaming at home and who's not and therefore what habits we might create and what habits we might lose in different demographics mm -hmm. exactly to your same point not just about creativity but about consumption C can i can i bring in chiedza as well if i've forgive me if i pronounce your name wrong chiedza but you also had your hand up uh, a moment ago um but may have uh lost you um all right we'll come to you in a second yelena are you are you there i can see your hand is up. Yes. Hi there. Hello. Yeah. Far away. Hello. Um, yeah. I think it's there's clearly a trade-off in this. I think something that's really positive, if you will, from this outbreak is the fact that all of these large museums and art galleries have made these online source online resources very rapidly and freely available. Whether it's the National Theatre live screenings, things like that. And Victoria, you mentioned about the freeze online viewing room. And I think when I first thought about that, and as a university student myself, on the one hand, post lockdown, there is no excuse now not to widen access to the arts beyond mm. London audiences from you know, a wider range of socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, but I think Simon and Mandy both pointed out that there clearly is a real trade off here. Providing free resources isn't long term sustainable, especially not in an industry that is already underfunded and undervalued as it is. Um, and Alison, and I think James, you mentioned this as well during the thinking with um, Hannah Rothschild, that there is also a chance that we could have a post-COVID almost over-focus on um, refunding the larger arts institutes in London. So I know that questions aren't allowed, but I suppose the question I've been thinking is how we can balance ensuring that there is a wider um, range of people who can access the arts and ensuring that we maintain this, because I think that is really positive, whilst also ensuring that the arts do survive and thrive after after COVID, I suppose. Can I, I, I'm going to, you know, the rule is there are no questions except they're, unless they're really good ones. And you know, that's a good one, so you win. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to put it to, to Victoria. And if I might, Victoria, I'm going to try and wrap in a point that I see Mark Golden has made in the, in the chat here, which is, you know, a number of people have made this point. I saw Daphne Rowe made the same point, which is a lot of artists who are locked in and who, of course, have got nothing to do but actually be quite creative. How do you think the world is going to harness both the sort of flourishing of lockdown creativity and then the point that Yelena is making, that the sort of the realisation that we can have a world of art and culture that is much more accessible to a much wider group of people. I mean, when you're thinking, presumably, in putting together Freeze as a digital proposition, you're thinking about both of these things. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm aware that, you know, this fair that we're launching this week might be the most visited fair that we've ever put on because it's digital. And yeah anyone anywhere in the world can, can visit without getting on a plane. Um, but I, I think, you know, it, it's, I've been thinking a lot about just the, you know, the role of art at this time. And um, the fact that this lockdown period seems kind of like without the arts would have been unimaginably awful. <laughs> and mm. I probably speak for most people on this call and, and everywhere that we've all spent huge amounts of time online um, watching films or, you know, reading books or watching streams opera or ballet or theatre, whatever it is, um, and, and that it has given us all, you know, an enormous amount of kind of hope and joy at this time. Um, in terms of where it goes from there, you know, there are, of course, there are so many challenges and, and problems and negatives at the moment. We've actually just announced today that um, an arts institution in Sydney called Carriage Works has gone into administration. So this is a real, a real challenge, like this really could happen to museums and, and arts organisations. Um, but at the same time, it has been an incredible learning experience, you know, and it's been an opportunity too to try things differently. And I think the next step is, you know, now we know that there are these vast audiences for things that can be put out digitally, although they will never replicate the kind of physical experience of standing in front of a painting or the communal experience of being in a theatre uh, with other people. Um, I think it has forced us all to try new things. And if those can be turned into ways of generating revenue for arts organisations in the future, um, then hopefully they will be, you know, something that will not only get them through this period, but become something that as Yelena says, will kind of open doors to much, much bigger audiences in the future. 
Victoria, thank you. We've seen the first example, at least we've been doing a month or more of these digital thinkings. We've seen the first example of someone in effect screaming in the chat, no exclamation mark, carriage works, exclamation mark. I imagine it was louder when it was typed. But, but I, I think I want to sort of offset that, if I might, by asking Alice Gilmore if she'll weigh in. Because Alice has written something I don't know whether I agree with it, but I just like the sentiment. <laughs> Alice, saying that you're saying that we're all too doom and gloom. I just think we need to be careful that we don't get to doom and gloom, um, because I think it's made everyone think in lockdown how much they value live performance and that it will come back. Um, so it's a question of how we sustain everyone until it comes back, going back to a sort of um, universal basic income almost. You know, that's how I see it. You don't want people going into different jobs. You want them keeping doing what they're doing, ready to come straight back into it people will come back happier than ever to be at something, I hope. It's, well, it's, it's interesting, and I'm gonna put it to Tristram how long, because in your comment in the chat, Alice, you say, well, maybe this is just a year, if, we, if we're hopeful about a vaccine, maybe that we're looking at a year. And so it's a hiatus, it's not a fundamental end to the arts and how we get from here to there. I also, by the way, would love to see if we could bring in Michael Longhurst um, I'm a massive fan of the Donmar, and if it's that Michael Longhurst, it'd be great to, to hear from him how they're, how they're planning. But Tristram, what do you think of that point, that actually we shouldn't try and think that we're, we're trying to, you know, if you like, rewire, remake the whole uh, ecosystem of the art. We're just trying to get, you know, across this gap. I think we just don't know, because um, on the one hand, there is that sense, you know, will everyone, having been pent up for, for so long, want to come and see a Donatello for themselves, or they want to see a Julia Margaret Cameron picture for themselves, or they want that social interaction, will they want to be in the galleries and, and, and the courtyards, or will the nervousness be such that it will keep them away? And all the indications we have at the moment is that the nervousness overplays the kind of enthusiasm for the return. So I think this is going to be um, a, a long haul. I think confidence will pick up and new norms will pick up and what we're wrestling with at the at the gallery is how do you get people to come to the VNA and have an enjoyable experience in our Japan galleries and Islamic art galleries and cast courts while also know that they're in a place of safety that they they don't need to over worry about being there because no one's going to come in you know on the Piccadilly line or on a bus um, if they're feeling that at the end of that, they're going to be just as nervous uh, as, as they were on, on public transport. So I want to be optimistic and we are going to be an optimistic place. Um, and you are going to come back and see uh, those items, which are your collections. These are all your things. So you should be able to come and see them in, in an enjoyable way. But I think we also just as, as, a, as a, you know, a, a, an organization dealing with public money, have an understanding that this is an 18 month, two year process. So, you know, and if we get a vaccine and it's returned to normal, because we're also, as, as I said at the beginning, you know, 50% of our visitors are global visitors. Um, and, you know, air travel, um, as we've seen yesterday with the, the Virgin Atlantic uh, news, is, isn't going to be coming back quickly. So, I mean, that's precise for us, but but also, you never know about the human condition, do you? And it'll be interesting, you know, will London be different to Cornwall? Will Cornwall be different uh, to mm -hmm. the North East? Will Scotland have a different uh, approach? So we will have to take it as it comes. But I am I think it's an 18-month, two-year kind of return trajectory. All right, I'm going to start bringing in a sort of catalogue of people with different points of view, if I may. Um, I was just looking at the list of people who are here with us. Tony Butler, I can see, is on, who I think runs the Museum of Derby. It would be great yeah. to hear his point, of, his point of view, too. Um, I'm going to... First, I need to tell you that you the excitement is, whoever, whatever happens, Tristram, Oliver Clark says, yes, yes, can't wait to come back, even if I have to wear a space suit, dealing both with COVID and obviously the dust problem that exists in the DNA. So he's going to be fine. Um, but can I, could, in this last 15 minutes, what I'd love to do is start sort of drilling into ways that people can address it, address this problem. I see there's, Jack Campbell has made this really interesting point about 
okay, could you federalize certain arts institutions? Uh, I'd like to, if possible, come to David Blackburn, who said, could you create a private arts council, if you like, for donors? Um, I'd like to come to those in a second, but Chris Car Garrod has had his hand up, and Chris, if you know him, works for Culture Unstained, or was one of the driving forces of Culture Unstained, and obviously you've thought for a long time, Chris, about how do we rethink arts funding. Yours was obviously specifically around, or in a good deal about climate prior to this, but this crisis, how has it made you think about the future of arts funding? I think it has really um, kind of thrown up this, this question of where we, we kind of uh, compromise or give ground. And so we really saw, I think, like you alluded to, James, b before this, um, these questions about Sackler money, about BP funding and so on. And there was this real kind of questioning or uh, critical reflection upon the values that are at the heart of our cultural institutions. Like what is it that the cultural sector offers and, and, and does the institution as a whole embody those values that are in the work, in the way that we support workers and artists and so on. Um, and now there's gonna be, we said there's gonna be this big financial pressure, but then, then what, what gives and, you know, is it actually a moment to compromise on our values or really take the opportunity to center those values, whether it's about climate, whether it's about inclusion, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. And I think an interesting thing is there's a risk, and I noticed this in the chat, of a parallel with the response to austerity as well. The, the kind of government narrative around uh, financial scarcity is what determines the kind of conditions that we expect to work within within the cultural sector. And we, we had a situation where people were working at national museums on below living wage. And well, actually, maybe we need to make, Hannah Rothschild was making the point, we need to make a much bigger demand of government that it actually is much more realistic for government to step up and sustain the cultural sector. So those things about low pay and being paid late and all, all of those things that we just sort of accept that's how arts and culture functions. Actually, mm. maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe we need to try and demand a bit more. And, and, and so specifically, Chris, what are you saying? You're, you're saying that we need a much higher level of government funding of the arts. Yes, yeah, and I think sustainably going forward. And I think it's, it's been shown again and again that, that there is a strong economic argument about the economic mm -hmm. return that the creative industries bring. I think that's really sound, and I think most people here would agree with that. But also, art and culture as an end in itself, as being of, of net worth to society. Someone uh, mentioned about the way that Germany has previously supported artists and so on, that, you know, there are other models that function in a, a different way. And we do see that, that kind of return. And funding and sustaining the sector will, will have those kind of much wider benefits for freelancers and so on, but also right. frees people up to center their ethics and their values, to not feel they have to compromise around forming partnerships with, a company like BP or an arms company or something just in order to keep the doors open. We, we shouldn't be putting that kind of um, that ethical pressure onto our cultural institutions. It's the responsibility of government to sustain them. Chris, thank you. Thanks so much. Is, can I ask, is, is Michael Longhurst there? I don't know whether or not he's able to join us and tell us what things look like at the Donmar, if it, if it is that Michael Longhurst. If you're there, this is the moment. No, he's off stage, backstage. Um, and likewise, Tony Butler, are you there? I'm, from the Museum of Derby, I'd be interested to know how you're looking. Hello, Tony. Hi, hello. Oh, you are there. Hello there. Yeah, hi. So, so I'm just really interested, you know, when you listen to what Tristram's saying and others are saying, how does it look to you? So, um, we are, a, we're subsidised, invested in by our local authority and by the Arts Council. And so the, the, the immediate crisis is not an existential one for us. And um, we are, um, we run three museums across the city. We are what one, one would describe as a, a civic museum. We are founded in the 19th century, much along the same lines as, you know, as those big London museums like the V&A. And we play a really important role in the civic life of our city. And I think the point I was trying to make earlier, was making earlier on the chat was that, even before the crisis, there was something very profound happening within, within our city centres regarding the usage of, 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 of them as places to live, trade and, um, and, and play. So what this has done is, is accelerated the, the, the inevitable decline of retail in our city centres. And there's a really important role, I think, as we emerge from this for 
cultural organisations, you know, in my case, museums and galleries, to help reimagine what a city centre and what a, a civic space where people can live and play looks like. Um, in the, in the very short term, it's, it's likely that museums and galleries are going to be you know, the first back. Um, we'll probably mm -hmm. be back before um, theatres and, and cinemas. So we're gonna, we are in the vanguard of, of the reopening and, and all, almost the sort of the reimagining. Yeah. So, so there's a really important role, I think, for local councils to play. I think one of the things that COVID has also shown is that when, you know, when everyone's back against the wall, it's local councils that step in and, and coordinate working with the community and voluntary sector. So I'd hope that, it, that this reinforces or and makes people fall, fall back in love with their councils, something I think this government's been particularly poor at doing over the last 10 years or so. So it, it, it's one thing giving a little bit more strength and power to local councils. It's also in a, in a museums and galleries perspective, looking at regional galleries as extensions of a, of a national strategy, of a national collection. So Derby has this, uh, has the world's best collection of work by Joseph Wright of Derby, the, the, mm. the Art of the Enlightenment. We, we hold these collections, not just for the people of our city, but for the, for the nation. But at the moment, there's really little investment in collections from you know from from central government so I, I think that's one thing in particular that, that, that they can do but as, as a general point the opportunity now is to is, is for the cultural organizations to really think and and reimagine what a city center is in the 21st century and can, can, can i just can i just though go back to your point about councils and I, i'm sort of wary or nervous that you know groups like this because it, almost by definition everyone who's on cares about the arts kind of succumbs to wishful thinking and particularly around funding the reality of the pressures on councils the pr pressures on government funding means that yes even if you do fall in love a little more with your council even if you do think you like the idea that chris just mentioned of greater public funding there's going to be a whole priority list for governments that backed by the public that is going to be higher on the list and actually isn't it time for us to also be more supportive of philanthropists you know corporate donations different kinds of financial backing because the reality is we can't just expect that this is going to come out of government and tax uh, taxpayer um funding but okay that i except that however we've spent organizations like mine have spent the last 10 years spreading risk by um inventing all sorts of new income streams from mm. earned income mm. commercial activity to donations and, and you shut the economy down <laughs> and it is it's a massive level so to to to, to imagine that the, the private sector and and philanthropy will will be the thing that that, that gets us out of this is I, I, I think it's what was argued during the years of austerity and it didn't really work right. so I, it's, it, it is this so I think it is it's it's much more of a partnership and a, and a kind of re-establishment of that kind of social contract between the private the public which is what the the basis of these organizations like mine were when they were founded back in the in, in the 19th century so so Tony, thank you so much i really appreciate it I'd, li I'd like to bring in jack campbell if i can because jack you had an idea which sounded really exciting but i didn't really understand necessarily what it was what what's your thought around federalizing arts organizations what does that mean yep um so well just on the, some of the points that have been made around funding um I, I think it's quite funny that sometimes arts institutions are the first to um, turn their nose up to money uh, but they're maybe the last who actually can afford to. Um, you know, regarding Chris's point, we heard about, um, you know, money being turned down from the Sacklers and from oil companies. I think um, coming out of this crisis, um, I think we'll have to see more power going towards some of these big corporate donors. And I think arts institutions will maybe need to be a bit more uh, a bit more willing to take that money on. So that's one option, uh, maybe, in, in, in light of, of, of there not being much government funding or much prioritization of um of funding to the arts from government um so there's that option of of, of having more more power to donors or secondly maybe maybe federalizing arts institutions and by that i'd uh 
I'd read a, a, a good piece from a, a reformed Scotland, a think tank that deals with, with universities. And they made the point about maybe federalizing some of our universities, of, of combining them and just having different campuses. Um, so, for example, you could combine my university, St Andrews, with Dundee and have one sort of based university. Um, and I, I don't see how we can, can't do that with, um, with arts institutions, maybe strengthen the balance sheets by, by uh, federalizing them and consolidating them into one sort of entity. Um, with that, they have a stronger balance sheet, they can get more loans. Um, and maybe even just in the short term, this could this could allow them to get these loans to see themselves sort of through the next couple of years until maybe government funding can start coming through again. Um, I guess it's an interesting point culturally because I realise that lots of different institutions have different cultural values and represent different things. Um, but again, I, I don't think the arts really can afford to be turning their nose up uh, to funding opportunities in this time. Okay, well, that's, that's a really interesting thought. Jack, thank you very much. I'm going to, in the last few minutes, come to a few people. I don't know whether, I, I'm actually quite struck by Ulrike Oke's point. Um, I don't know whether Ulrike is there and can uh, uh, join us because, hello there. Ulrike, do you, do you want to just, I know we've got a short amount of time, but do you want to just make the point particularly about, you know, the, the, just the, the, the divergence about who's going to get the money and what the impact that's going to be in terms of the audiences that are, engaged in and, and enjoying the arts? Right, so I run Black Cultural Archives and um, I was really thinking about all the points being made about monetizing and who's going to have access and for us the fact that Black History actually has a building is really important to our co communities and for us to start charging for our content that would work in terms of things like a membership scheme maybe and members having exclusive access but it could also alienate some of our audiences by creating a kind of two-tier system of who has access to culture and who doesn't and then I was also kind of reflecting on what Esme Ward's done in Manchester with the collections before all this happened where she was putting collections in places like Manchester Piccadilly train station so that people could see them in different spaces and starting to wonder about whether that's something that we can start to do is think about not just our buildings but also where we can share that isn't always going to be online for us we've really found that some of our communities and audiences actually don't have access to zoom or the internet or devices well, that's, um, Ari, thank you very much. We, we're going to, uh, I like the fact that we're ending uh, less gloomily than we began, partly I think because people are coming in with some thoughts of what we do structurally. I'm going to come finally to back to Victoria and Tristram. Victoria, when you think about a sort of practical thing that, that arts organisations can do, either alone or with each other, what would you recommend? And I'll put the same point to you in a moment, Tristram. Um I mean, I thought for beyond arts organisations, what everybody can do, I guess. Um, I mean, we've talked a lot about government's relief and stimulus, which, of course, is at the heart of all of this. What we also need to know is how we can be open safely. You know, we need some kind of concrete guidance on how a museum can open its doors and bring in the noise, how a theatre can open its doors. You know, museums are reopening in Germany. Um, this is happening in other parts of the world. And... Um, so I think that that's really essential is to understand how we can get through this period until there is a vaccine. Um, in terms of what we can do as individuals, um, those who can should buy art. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, buy art, support artists, support galleries. Um, all museums and nonprofits have friend schemes. So if you're not buying art, become a friend of your local arts organization. Um, and um, obviously corporations have a role to play here, which has been discussed already, but I think them being very open about what they will support and kind of just keeping organizations going through this period. You know, we will be open again. You know, this is, it, this will be over. We just need to kind of tide everybody through this period and it will take an army. Thank you. Victoria, thank you. Tristram? I think arts organizations need, need a clear plan for the digital response over the next 12 to 18 months, if they can. Uh, and then a clear plan with funders and supporters about a reopening strategy. I think we will have a mixed economy of funding. I, I agree with Chris, there needs to be more public support, but I don't want to be entirely funded by the state. Um, I want to be supported by members. And I think what all of us can do is keep our membership up uh, of um, arts organisations and cultural um, organisations, even if 
they're, they're closed. I think we should be alert to the fact that it is much harder to get private philanthropy in Derby or Stoke-on-Trent or Nottingham or Lincoln than it is in London. Uh, and so talking about that mixed economy is, is easier in the capital than it is in other parts of the country. And I think this will make us quite rightly as national organisations reflect on our national responsibilities. Um, and so I hope our, uh, our friend from St Andrews University is going to make the not very long journey uh, to V&A Dundee. <laughs> uh, to support uh, that museum in the coming months. And my final sort of policy recommendation, which is my bugbear, um, which is that we are the only country, I think, in Europe uh, that doesn't have hotel taxes. And if we want to support cultural organisations in Cornwall uh, or in Bath or uh, in, right across the country, having a hotel tax, which then goes into cultural institutions, to galleries, to theatres, to the places that make those cities and regions special, that why people are visiting them, seems to me a revenue stream that everyone is used to, a right around the world, uh, and something we should think about for the future. Christian, thank you so much. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us, for joining us for an hour. As you know from a thinking, the idea is to come away with some, some concrete things to think about. How the money goes to revenue funding rather than capital funding is one how we think about a private arts council coordinating the big private donors is another, how we think about really directing digital revenues from new platforms to the arts is another. I think the federalizing idea is really interesting and I think it will probably be happening. I'm really alert for us journalistically to keeping alive to the relationship between the big arts organizations and the small ones to the capital and the country. Um, I, I was really struck by the pipeline of art and artists, particularly among students. And I suppose the fact that we ended on something that was really concrete, that we could look into and examine how we could make happen, hotel taxes, means that we've not just talked, but we've hopefully come away with some ideas of how things can be done differently and we can help. Uh, all I really wanted to do is say thank you hugely to everyone who in this weird world finds that we have sometimes less time than we had even before and made an hour available to be part of this conversation, particularly, of course, to uh, Tristram Hunt and to Victoria Siddle. Thank you too to Santander who sponsored this. And just so you know, we really appreciate that backing. We understand exactly what it is to try and make things work in this environment. Uh, have a very good afternoon or wherever you are, a very good day. Uh, appreciate your time. Take care.